Good afternoon, everybody. Um, a very warm welcome to Stuart Sign Bites. Um, now today, I'm very, very, very happy to say that I have the pleasure of Tom Quick's company. Um, so Tom is a consultant orthopedic surgeon um, specialising in peripheral nerve injury. Um, and uh, Tom's based at the Royal National Orthopaedic Hospital in Stanmore. He is also um, an expert witness in personal injury and clinical negligence cases. So a great person to have with us. Thank you ever so much, Tom. Really appreciate you coming to speak to us. Um, we thought it would be interesting today to um, talk a little bit about brachial plexus injuries. Um, we deal with clients, obviously, that have sustained catastrophic injuries, and normally they are spinal cord injuries, uh, serious traumatic brain injuries. Um, and I think sometimes peripheral nerve injury, for instance, is something that um, is a bit of a lesser known to us and um, kind of is something that maybe comes up down the line a little bit in terms of someone's recovery. So I thought it'd be really interesting um, to talk a little bit more about that today, Tom. Um, so I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm afraid, take you back to the very, very basics. Um, and can you just tell us a little bit more about brachial plexus injury and um, what, what the brachial plexus is and where it is and just give us a bit of a basic overview. Well, it's nerves essentially in your neck that flow. So nerves that come from the brain down the spinal cord, they come out through five levels, like um, levels of a, of a house to join up a mix in your neck. And if you tilt your head over to one side, you can feel a tight band just in here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna try it. Behind your collarbone, that's the one. So that is oh. your upper trunk of your brachial plexus. So that sits oh. behind this sternocleidomastoid muscle and runs just behind the collarbone. So this is the supraclavicular, the bit above the collarbone, but it runs down alongside the shoulder joint in front of the shoulder and splits into the nerves that you've probably heard of, the radial nerve, the median nerve, the ulnar nerve. So all of those nerves come from, just like rivers running together, the Thames comes from four or five different other smaller uh, rivers. These are the, uh, the beginnings of all of those nerves in the, in the neck. And nerves bring movement and feeling and growth and control and proprioception um, and, and the mediation of pain to, to the upper limb. There's a similar one down in your in your pelvis for the for the leg called the lumbar sacral plexus but the brachial plexus arm that means uh, brachium means arm and plexus just means sort of a mixed up connecting box wow that's really interesting thank you tom um i mean <clears throat> we obviously um work um in the field of serious injury and um as i've mentioned we deal with people with people who have sustained spinal cord injuries and serious brain injuries and how, how common is injury to the brachial plexus um, as a result of, for instance, um, spinal cord injury? And can damage to the nerves occur after the main trauma as well through, you know, transfers or kind of movement of restriction at post main injury? So, yeah, so the brachial plexus is a what we call a lower motor neuron. So we split anatomically the nerves of the body into its central nervous system which is the brain and your spinal cord and they all lie within a sac called the dura which is just a, a fibrous sac that holds the csf the fluid that bathes the um, cns now that never really interested me brain and spinal cord surgery a because they're locked away in bony boxes and probably should be should be left there those crazy surgeons that go poking around inside there um, <laughs> but um, the PNS the peripheral nervous system has the ability to regenerate and regrow which the CNS doesn't because of the supportive cells the glial cells the nerves are the same but the environment's different so the the types of injury are very different and how how common is a PNS injury with a CNS injury probably highly uh, common but we mm. don't have a great deal of data on that um, as we were talking just before we started recording, there's a great deal of um, uh, urgency about treating brain and spinal cord injuries because things can be getting worse. You can lose your life if you don't deal with an expanding hematoma or a severe brain injury. And often people are instituted, you know, medically induced comas. Mm. Uh, spinal cord often, you know, the, the bony bits need stabilizing and everyone's concerned about that. So all those life-saving and stopping progression problems take uh, obvious priority but when people wake from a coma and it's noted that one arm doesn't work it doesn't fit necessarily with a central nervous system problem 
because problems there tend to produce spasticity, high tone. So mm. even though it doesn't move, when somebody else tries to move it, the muscles are fighting that. It's not floppy or flaccid. And then a PNS problem, a peripheral nervous system problem, you get a flail or a um, floppy arm. And that is one of the first signs. But people just think, oh, it's, it's probably the brain injury. So sometimes yeah. it, it, is, it is overlooked. Yeah, it's it's really it's really interesting because obviously as 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 non medics we are completely guided by all of our expert evidence and it's it's not something that we ever you know come across until a later stage when it's been recommended by a, a sort of a, a yeah. primary expert I suppose. You're right, and you asked previously whether these things can can come on later. Um, mm. I think I think we've seen certainly through the COVID crisis we've just recently published on problems when people are in intensive care that you can get nerve injuries just through the fact that you are unconscious for long periods of time, particularly wow. when people are prone nursed, which occasionally happens with spinal cord or head injuries to decrease pressure, but more so nowadays it's used for COVID and respiratory problems, that you can get pressure and traction upon the brachial plexus. There's also neuropathies of um, intensive care. So when people have all the drugs and the ionotropes and they're incredibly unwell, you can get a neuropathy that is started there. So not only can it be created by the original primary injury, but it can come on throughout, you know, the care, the acute care that they receive. And you're right, these are identified often late by medical practitioners or paramedical practitioners, um, but often don't get the investigation or the, or the diagnosis needed. That's always a, a concern. But I suppose um, linking into that quite nicely, and I wanted to ask you a little bit about how to kind of identify um, main symptoms that um, that we that we need to look out for and, and um, keep, keep an eye on throughout rehab, I guess. So, yeah, I think that last word, rehab, is one of the key things that links in with the basic principles of any of these complex in, in injuries is that we do need a huge multidisciplinary team to deal with these things because they invest every part of a patient's life. So the majority of the complaints that patients with a nerve injury have, number one is pain, I think number two and number three are also pain. So neuropathic pain, um, it occurs probably with greater frequency in the adult population after a nerve injury than it does in childhood nerve injuries, but it's still a significant problem in, in both. And neuropathic pain is frequently life altering, uh, mm. severe, uh, all encompassing, um, and so that's really, it's that lancinating, electric, um, squeezing, crushing, all of these adjectives for neuropathic pain. And that's pain that's different to a nociceptive pain. So if you burn your hand, you get the signals through your nerves to say you mm. burn your hand. But that is a sign of tissue damage. So that's the smoke alarm going off in your house because there is smoke or a burglar alarm going off because there's a burglar. But neuropathic pain is the smoke alarm or um burglar alarm going off without a necessary cause so it's it's gone faulty um, so pain is the number one problem um, weakness or lack of control of of, of movement muscle loss um, problems with skin with sweating with hair growth with um, bone growth in the kids so nerves control all of these things and strange feelings dysthesia un unpleasant feelings or paresthesia tingling mm. feelings these can all break into uh, pain as well. So, you know, it is, it's, it's, it's the whole experience of, of, of being a human being from pain to movement, to interaction, to function, the whole yeah. lot. Yeah. And to someone that doesn't know anything about it, I know someone, you know, someone's been injured, it's difficult to, to pin. Sometimes it's difficult even to describe pain, isn't it? And I suppose that must make it really hard to, 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 figure out sometimes the the source of the problem i mean is it is it difficult to diagnose are there tests you know nerve conduction studies and all sorts of different tests that are being used i think it is hard and i think it's even harder for patients when they don't get a diagnosis these mm. injuries last for years and years um you know two three years would be a sort of normal time course of uh, recovery to like a fracture in six weeks or um yeah more, more minor injuries. Um, but the key thing is clinical examination. We're a very sort of old school specialty because there isn't a scan that will easily give us a diagnosis. There isn't like in brain surgery, you know, grossly you can get a CT scan. If you don't have a CT scan, you, you generally don't get to speak to a neurosurgeon. They say scan first and then talk to me. Whereas, mm. you know, yes, nerve conduction studies can add extra data, but they don't give you a diagnosis often. Um, and 
an MRI scan or an ultrasound. Um, but it's clinical examination. It, it's looking at all of those modalities of nerve function, and not just once, but in different time periods. So you're not just seeing a still from a film, you're seeing the whole, the whole story. Um, mm. But yeah, I think it's, it is, it's that clinical expertise, it's teamwork um, and knowledge, information, letting the patient know where you are with that diagnosis, what's likely to be the natural history and what can be done. Yeah. And I suppose then moving naturally on from diagnosis, um, uh, looking, I, I wanted to talk a wee bit about um, treatment um, and I'm sure there's, um, like everything now, there are lots of different types of treatment. I was wondering if you just talked to us a little bit about the, the treatment um, that's on offer. And as well, for you've already mentioned, people often have these injuries that are lifelong and it impact upon their function and the, every aspect of their life um, for the rest of their lives. And I'm wondering how important is um, not just the initial kind of treatment for X period of time, but then sort of maintenance rehab on an ongoing basis. Could you tell us a wee bit about that? Yeah, um, it's, Emma, it's, it's, you're absolutely right. It is, it is long, long term. So I think, you know, we need to treat surgical interventions as part of a global intervention. So there's loads of surgeries that we can do, but without psychology, without physical therapy, occupational therapy, pain physicians, we all have to work together. But the bits mm. I do, the bits that I know best about, um, probably the, the most pertinent uh, bits of nerve surgery nowadays are a technique that we have that's sort of been developed over the past 20 years and popularized recently called nerve transfer. Um, and that's a method that we can use in injuries that aren't even of a, of a nerve injury, but we can use it to treat spinal cord injury um, or, or nerve root uh, injuries that we can take a wire um, imagine in your house, if your television has um, the plug to your TV is broken, so the wires to your hands, the plug to your TV isn't, isn't working. Mm. What you can do is you can unplug a lamp in one end of a room and run a wire to your TV. So you get the TV, but maybe the lamp's not as bright or the lamp doesn't work. And we can do that principle by transferring nerves. So I can take a nerve, for example, from the wrist flexors to bring back elbow bending. So if you've lost the power to bend your elbow and your arms just all floppy, the wires that come down to the hand come down past the elbow. And I can go into those, open up the nerve and find within that internet cable, a tiny wire that comes to the wrist flexors. And we don't need strong wrist flexion. This was for when we were quadrupeds and being chased or chasing prey. There's not mm. much to do with great wrist flexion strength. So I can steal a few of those nerves as they're passing here and wire those into the biceps and brachialis muscle. These grow in, control the muscle. The brain still thinks it's bending the wrist. So at first you think bend the wrist and the arm comes up. But over time with what we call plasticity, the ability of the brain to relearn, you can separate the function of arm bending from, from uh, wrist bending. We can do that with intercostal nerves, the breathing nerves. So you, you breathe in and your arm comes up. But then over time you recognize you can bring the arm up without breathing in. But if wow. we put a needle in those nerve tests that we asked about, that muscle still tries to breathe and it still thinks it's a breathing muscle. So there's a whole load of techniques that we have for pain, for function. Um, and it's, again, it's, they are time dependent, a lot of them, and they have to be the different options at different times on a longer patient's long, long treatment course. Yeah. Wow. Is there, I'm sure there must be, um, I was going to ask you, are there any um, kind of groundbreaking Kind of, is there any kind of groundbreaking research going on at the moment or anything that's kind of being trial and tested but isn't yet kind of out there as, as a potential treatment? So well, yes. basically I want the behind the curtain goss. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, so two things really briefly, stem cells, everyone always asks us about stem cells. Uh, mm. We have an institute at UCL called the Centre for Nerve Engineering with my colleagues, uh, Professor Shipley uh, and um, uh, Professor James Phillips. Um, and there we had a patient engagement day and we had all the questions from patients, what is going on? And stem cells were the big thing. The answer is probably not quite just yet, but hopefully. Uh, mm -hmm. But one thing we're getting closer to, we don't have any drug or nerve injury. So if you yeah. had a heart attack in the 1950s, there were no drugs. You were told, have some bed rest. If it's really terrible, we'll have to sew your heart back together. But otherwise, it is going to be as it is. And we're in that state now with nerve injury. If it's terrible, I can do some stitching and playing around. But generally, there's nothing we can do 
and we just watch it slightly get better, but we can't affect or improve that. So we need a drug, we need a drug desperately. Um, and we've managed in some animal trials now to identify a few target drugs that are showing great benefits. And it's now looking at clinical translation for those. So hopefully we will have a drug that for any level of nerve in injury, not just that sort of top of the iceberg of the really severe, but for everybody, we'll be able to have some ability to improve upon the outcome from those who've had a, a nerve injury. So yeah, drugs and stem cells, I think are, 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 the, are the next things. But as you yeah. mentioned, tests, um, scans, we don't yet have scans that show us functional um, uh, pieces of anatomy, how things are working rather than just how they, how they look. So we're working on that as well. Wow, so interesting. And I think it's, it's as, as a non-medic, it's, it's so interesting to hear some of that stuff. Thank you so much, um, Tom. That's absolutely fascinating. Um, I, can't, I can't go without giving a bit of a shout out to your Twitter because you have such a great Twitter page with loads and loads of brilliant information on it um, about, about all of this stuff. But well, it's not just um, what we've been talking about today is a tip of the iceberg. <laughs> I think you'll agree. So um, there's absolutely tons of stuff um, on Tom's Twitter, which is just brilliant. Um, and if you don't mind, Tom, I'll probably link your handle onto the end of this recording, if that's okay. Um, and um, I also wanted to shout out the amazing background that you have. I think it's um, the most interesting background <laughs> that we've seen so far. They are just, um, they are just plastic, there's no... There's no, no. <laughs> well, that's reassuring. <laughs> um, most of us opt for this kind of safe background, so it's really nice to see something different. But listen, thank you ever so much again. I could I could talk on forever um, about all this stuff. It's so interesting, but we've only got 15 minutes, so I'm going to wrap us up, I'm afraid. But thank you, Tom. I really, really appreciate you being with us. Um, and hopefully we'll be able to um, coax you back in uh, to come and do another session at some stage in the future. That's been a real pleasure, Emma. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye, everyone.